small blue planet, seemingly insignificant in the vast universe. For us, this is home. We have lived on this planet for thousands of years and have been asking perhaps the most fundamental question. From where did everything that we see around has come from? Earth was never the same as it appears today. Some 4.5 billion years ago, accretion of a large chunk of matter from the solar nebula led to the evolution of Earth. Large amount of volcanic outgassing created the primordial atmosphere. Eventually, the Earth's outer layer cooled to form a solid crust. With more than 70% of surface now covered with liquid water, life was conducive. Since then, we have come a long way. Come, let's begin our journey into this vast expanse of the universe. Get along to understand our past and explore the future. Today, modern cities are testament to the technological accomplishments that we have undergone in the last several decades. Across the globe, cities that never sleep are surrounded with rush hour traffic and high-rise buildings that dazzle with millions of lights. Cities that are crowded with people who are in constant race against time have forgotten to look above and admire the beauty of the night sky. Far away from these cities, tucked amidst breathtaking beauty of the Himalayas, Hanle, a picturesque village in the Changtang region of Ladakh in Jammu and Kashmir, is changing the way we look at our universe today. Home to one of the highest altitude observatories in the world, this site currently caters to the optical infrared and gamma ray related astronomical observations. The Indian Astronomical Observatory aboard the Mount Saraswati is housed to 2.1 meter Himalayan Chandra telescope. Dedicated to the famous astrophysicist Dr. Subramanyam Chandrasekhar, the telescope is situated at the height of 15,000 feet, placing it above 40% of Earth's atmosphere. The site provides an unprecedented view of the universe that help astronomers acquire details of some of the most elusive objects in the sky. The remoteness of the telescope and the health complication arising due to high altitude makes it least accessible for astronomers to visit the observatory. A dedicated satellite link therefore allows remote access of the telescope controls from the Center for Research and Education in Science and Technology Campus, CREST, in Hosakote on real-time basis. Dr. Padmakar Parihar, an astronomer from the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, has scheduled for remote observing session using the Himalayan Chandra telescope. He is here today to observe a dense interstellar cloud 
well known as the Orion Nebula. Basically, it is a, a, a mixture of uh, uh, gas, 99% gas, and 1% uh, dust, both gas and dust mixed. And in pockets, there are uh, huge gases uh, region, but in pockets, there are star forming region happening here and there. One of the reasons which is very interesting is the Orion Nebula cluster uh, at the heart of the Orion Nebula. And uh, it's a small region uh, uh, illuminated by trapezium clusters, which are uh, quite massive stars up to 25 solar mass. And it's a very nice place to study star formations because we can see varieties of objects at uh, different stages of uh, evolution. This young cluster of five bright stars, known as trapezium, are extremely hot and primarily responsible for illuminating majority of the nebulae. While Dr. Parihar prepares for observations, a group of amateur astronomers are out preparing for a night-long observation. Aaron Vegas and his friends dedicate most of their time hunting and astrophotographing deep sky objects. Today, they have their telescopes turned towards the Orion constellation. There are thousands of stars in the night sky and these stars form patterns which we call constellations. One such prominent constellation is that of Orion which depicts the hunter. It is really overwhelming to understand how people of different cultures throughout the ages have seen these constellations in different ways. Throughout the human history, we have looked up at the night sky with imaginations. Our ancestors thought that group of stars represented patterns of their gods and goddesses, heroes and animals. We call these patterns as constellations. Orion constellation which is visible in the night sky throughout the winter months is one of the easiest constellations to identify. The seven main stars make a distinctive figure of a hunter, wielding a club in his right hand and a shield in his left, while a sword dangles from his belt. People across the globe have visualized these very constellations differently and over the ages this has led to confusion in interpreting the sky. So just as we have Orion, we have a number of mythical creatures in the sky and uh, this created a bit of a confusion. So in order to avoid this, the International Astronomical Union in 1922 uh, divided the sky into 88 constellations which are fixed and are standard for astronomers throughout the world. Just as we have latitudes and longitudes, we have something called array and deck or right ascension and declination, uh, which we use for the sky. And instead of forming vague patterns like before, uh, what this does is it forms sort of a grid around the constellations and this covers the entire sky. Looking up at the sky on a cloud-free night, might make you wonder why do some stars shine brighter than the other and what is the reason for them having different colors if you look up at the night sky you see the different stars appear different to us right some are bright some are very very bright like Sirius or Vega some stars are very faint some stars appear blue in color some are red some are yellow and so on now all this is because stars are different and they have different properties right Space is truly three-dimensional, which means different stars are at different distances from us. Some stars are very close by and they'll appear brighter. Some stars are far away and therefore they appear fainter. Imagine that you're on a car traveling along a highway. Now you're going to see a row of street lamps along the highway fading away into the distance. Now you know each street lamp has the same brightness. They all have the same bulb in them. But the street lamps closer to you appear very bright. In fact, they blind your eye sometimes and the street lamps very far away are fainter. And as the street lamps get farther and farther away from you, they get fainter and fainter. Astronomers refer to this as apparent magnitude of a star, with magnitude being the measure of the brightness as seen by an observer on the Earth. 
uh, magnitude uh, system was actually first uh, developed uh, by Hipparchus. He was uh, a stargazer or the astronomers during the BCs. He introduced this concept uh, sometime in 150 BC when there were no telescopes uh, available. So he classified the stars based on the naked eye observations. He looked at uh, stars in the sky. In a given night, we can count about uh, 3000 stars. And these stars, he classified them into six groups based on their brightness levels. Hipparchus assigned the brightest star as the first magnitude, while a less bright star as the second magnitude and so on. Till the faintest star that he could probably observe through an unaided eye as sixth magnitude star. So for centuries, people have been looking at the stars with their naked eye, and naked eye being a limited instrument, only lets you see stars of a particular brightness range, right? And so in ancient times, astronomers classified stars into six groups ranging from one to six. Number one meant the brightest, six meant the faintest. Now telescopes came into the picture around 1600s and that changed astronomy completely, including the magnitude scale. The invention of the telescope revolutionized astronomy in every sense of the word. And one of the things it let us do was to look at fainter and fainter stars in the universe. When an Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei turned his newly made telescope towards the sky, only to reveal stars much fainter than the sixth magnitude. He writes in his astronomical treatise, Citerius Nuncius. Indeed, with the glass you will detect below the stars of the sixth magnitude such a crowd of others that escape a natural sight that is hardly believable. The largest of these we may designate as the seventh magnitude. As telescopes got bigger and better, astronomers kept adding more magnitudes to the bottom of the scale and negative magnitude were assigned to the stars brighter than zero magnitude. It was in 1856 when an Oxford astronomer, Norman Robert Poxon, proposed that a first magnitude star to be 100 times brighter than a sixth magnitude star using a logarithmic scale, thus making each step of one magnitude change by a factor of approximately 2.512 times. But there was a problem with apparent magnitude scale. It didn't tell us much about the star and its intrinsic brightness. It soon became clear that the apparent magnitude scale had problems. It was not measuring the properties of stars intrinsically, but is also confusing it with how far away they were from us. For example, if I shine a flashlight into your eyes, it looks much brighter than a floodlight from a stadium 10 kilometers away. This means that you're not measuring just how bright the objects are, but also the distances mixed with it. Therefore, there was a pressing need to redefine the entire magnitude scale more precisely. Thus, the concept of absolute magnitude was introduced. When we want to compare the magnitudes of the stars from one star to the other, then we would like to have a standard scale measurement. So another system was introduced which is called as the absolute magnitude. In this system, we would actually put the stars at one standard scale and this standard scale is, the, uh, is called as 10 PC scale. When you put all the stars at a distance of 10 parsec and try to measure its magnitude, what would be its magnitude, what would be its brightness? These magnitudes are called as the absolute magnitudes. For instance, the brightest star in the night sky is Sirius A. Located at the distance of 8.6 light years shines with an apparent magnitude of minus 1.46 while our sun with a magnitude of minus 26.7. If Sirius was to be placed next to our sun at 10 parsec scale, 
then it would outshine the sun by over 20 times. Apart from varying brightness, stars appear to have different colors. Colors that vary from bluish white to yellow and even red. The colors of stars are a primary function of their effective surface temperatures. A star typically behaves like a black body, emitting in all wavelengths, but peaking at a particular one corresponding to its surface temperature. Well, if you look at all the stars in the sky, and what you do is to uh, measure the temperature of those, and you plot it in a diagram that you have a temperature on one scale and the brightness of those stars on the other scale, then what you find is that there are different kind of stars with different kind of temperatures, surface temperatures you have. And that actually tells you that what you are basically collecting is the photons coming from those stars. Now, if they're cooler or hotter, then they will be producing photons at different frequencies, right? Now, these photons, if you take as a white light or the light coming in, if you let it pass through a prism, then you get a dispersion which will be your wave door, like in white light, then if the photons are produced at one particular frequency because they are the surface temperature is of such order, then you would get more photons at one particular band, which might be violet, which might be red or green, and depending on what kind of temperature of the stars we have. So depending on what photons we collect from a given stars, the maximum number of photons at that particular frequency will define the colors of those stars. The relationship between temperature and wavelength was first well explained by a German physicist, William Frank Wayne, in 1893. The way you measure the surface temperature of uh, any star, for example, the sun, then what you plot, the energy density in one, uh, on Y, and on X, you plot the wavelength, for example. Then what you find is that there will be a black body spectrum, which any black body source, which is a thermal equilibrium, it producing a spectrum well, there will be a peak. Now, there is a law, which is Wien's displacement law, which says that lambda, which is the wavelength, max, so the maximum of that curve at lambda, and then m, lambda m and the t, the temperature, will be constant. So if you know where, at what wavelength, the, the, the curve is peaking, that can give you the temperature. So a cold star would emit most of the radiation at longer wavelengths and hence they would appear red. While a hot star would emit most of its radiation at shorter wavelengths and therefore would appear blue. Frank Wayne was subsequently awarded Nobel Prize for his law governing the radiation of heat. Around the same time, the astronomy community got interested in classifying stars based on their surface temperature and spectral type. The story revolves around one of the most famous female astronomers of all time, Annie Jump Cannon. Annie Jump uh, Cannon uh, was a professor at the uh, Harvard University and uh, she was uh, she and her team uh, were working on uh, the classification of stars based on their spectra so this was this team was headed uh, by uh, Pickering uh, and uh, they they started uh, looking at the spectra of almost 4 lakh stars that's a huge amount of uh, stars to study in the year 1890, Professor Edward Pickering at Harvard College Observatory hired a group of women assistants to analyze stellar data in order to develop a system of classification of stars. One of Pickering's assistant, Annie Jump Cannon, was working on a new classification sequence that would help reduce the existing inconvenient classification scheme initially developed by Antonia Mori and Wilhelmina Fleming. Her meticulous observations led her to simplify the 22 type scheme into a sequence of surface temperature, assigning the alphabets O, B, A, F, G, K, 
and M. The sequence developed by Annie Jump has helped several generations of astronomers to classify stars. She was one of the uh, best women uh, astronomers during uh, those days and uh, she was given uh, credit for uh, this uh, kind of work where uh, she classified these stars based on the surface temperatures. Cannon showed the international astronomy community that women were as competent in astronomy as men. It's 8 p.m. Dr. Parihar is all set to observe his target object, the Orion Nebula. He is here to study one of the major processes taking place in the universe, the birth of stars. At a distance of 1,500 light years from us, this stellar nursery is a convenient place to study the complex process involved in the evolution of stars. Actually, the Orion uh, Nebula is around uh, 1 to 2 million year old uh, uh, system, right, as far as the age is concerned. And the uh, entire uh, um, uh, stellar uh, premium sequence, uh, stellar evolutionary process takes place in 10 million years time, right. So, uh, we need a similar star forming region, uh, but at a different phase of uh, um, you know, formation. And that's why we have to study different uh, nebula, uh, star forming regions uh, 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 associated with different ages, right? Starting from zero uh, age to 10 million. By observing several such nebulas at different stages of evolution, the story of the birth of a star can be written. It all starts in a cold, dark cloud of dust and hydrogen gas, where a quiet tug of war is about to begin. Parts of this cloud of gas, dust and molecules are going to be denser than the rest of the surroundings. The denser parts are going to be able to attract gas and dust around them and become more and more massive. As they become more massive, they'll attract even more gas and this is going to build up where, where it becomes even more massive. And as gas falls into these objects, they're going to lose energy and this energy is going to heat up the cloud. Hotter the cloud, the more the pressure. More the pressure, the more the cloud will resist collapse due to gravity. When this gravity pushing, making the cloud contract and the pressure due to its own heat pushing it out towards balance, we have a protostar. As gravity pulls more and more gas towards the center of the disk, it gets denser and hotter until it finally reaches 10 million degrees Celsius. A miraculous transformation takes place. Hydrogen atoms fuse together to form helium atom, releasing a burst of energy. A star is born. Once a star is born, it is going to have a long life ahead of it, but only as long as it has fuel to burn. A star is stable because the gravity pulling it inwards is balanced by the pressure because it's so hot. And it's hot because its nuclear fusion is generating enough heat in the center, radiating outwards. So the star can continue to be stable and shine brightly only as long as there is fuel only as long as there's enough hydrogen in the center to continue to form helium. In order to understand the life cycle of stars, a Danish astronomer, Ejnar Hertzsprung, and an American astronomer, Henry Norris Russell, independently devised a graph that could be easily called one of the most important diagrams in astronomy, the HR diagram. HR diagram is actually a very important tool in astronomy. Though it is called as a diagram, it's basically a graph. It was first introduced uh, by two astronomers independently, uh, by Hertzsprung and uh, by Russell. Independently, they had developed this diagram. What, are they, what they had done was, uh, they independently looked at various field stars in the sky and tried to look at their uh, magnitudes, that's their brightnesses of these stars, 
and also the temperatures of the stars the surface temperatures of the stars they randomly took the stars and measured their uh, surface temperatures and their uh, magnitudes in these magnitudes it could be apparent magnitudes or the absolute magnitudes and these two quantities were plotted on this diagram Hertzsprung and Russell used the large database of stars and plotted their luminosity versus its temperature. They observed that more than 90% of stars happen to lie on a band. They call this band the main sequence. Stretching from the upper left corner that is dominated by hot and luminous stars to the bottom right with stars that are cold and faint. These stars spent most of their life fusing hydrogen to helium. The giants and supergiants are plotted on the uppermost part of the diagram, while the white dwarfs are plotted below the main sequence on the lower left. Our sun is currently part of main sequence and lies in the center of the band. Sun the ultimate source of heat and energy for us is nothing but an ordinary star. If you look at the multitude of stars around us, the sun is but an average star. Right? Its mass is average, its size is average, its brightness is average. It's one among the millions of stars around us. But this very average star is supremely important to all of us. It's important to us on Earth because it gives us life. It gives us light and heat. And without this very average star, there would not be trees, plants, animals, and even us sitting here wondering how stars are formed. With a surface temperature of around 5,700 degrees Celsius, our sun generates around 380 billion billion megawatts of power. In one second, the sun churns out more energy than it has been ever used by all human civilizations. All that power produced in just a blink of an eye. Incredibly, it has been doing it for the last five billion years. Without the heat and light of the sun, life as we know could not have existed on this planet. How long would the sun keep burning like this? What will be the fate of our sun once it runs out of fuel? what will happen to our Earth. These mysteries of our Sun are now well understood.